Welcome to the Manchester is Blue show. Treat for you today, Blues. We've got ESPN senior writer Gabrielle Marcotti talking to myself today about all things City and, of course, the reboot to football. What have you been up to recently, Gabrielle? Well, so I've been um, I've been writing a lot about sort of how football is going to get back, uh, if it's going to get back, how it's going to get back, the rules, the implications. So that's kept me busy because obviously there's been you know, you have to talk to decision makers and stuff and, and they plan out different scenarios. But like we were saying before, for a lot of other guys, when there's no football going on, um, you inevitably get into lists and, and retrospectives. And it's funny because I think football comes at you so sort of fast and, and, and furious during the year that even stuff from like, I don't know, three, five, ten years ago, in some ways, you know, you're kind of psyched to to go back and reflect on it, or you know, there might be something you missed the first time around. Uh, let alone stuff from from Yonks ago. I know, mm. obviously, Manchester City Twitter, no doubt, uh, knows Gary James, um, who's who's all about um, the, you know the past and city and stuff like that. Yeah, I like Gary. So I I don't know. I I, I kind of enjoy some of that. I, I sort of learn like you know stuff that um, I didn't know for for ESPN. I did a piece on what I sort of consider to be the the first piece of viral football video, um, which was uh, the, the Diego Maradona warm up in 1989, um, the, the, the live is life um, sort of warm up where the music's in the background and he just does all these tricks in the warm up and the totally kick- psychs out Bayern. Yeah. What's sorry? The, the kick ups and the, uh, the warm yeah. drops into the air, it's phenomenal. Um, and so I, I, re- I did a piece last week, which I quite enjoyed because it was a break from all the pandemic negativity about how, you know, I, I, about the story behind it, you know, how that came into being, um, like a lot of stuff that people didn't know, perhaps like the fact that um, that footage never went to air. It was, it was basically only meant to air in the stadium. Bayern Munich had organized a whole pregame concert. They actually had a, they had a, a band there uh, that played like a cover band that played the song and that's what you hear. It's not a recording of the song. It's not even opus. It's, it's, it's a cover band playing it. And that was just so they could show it on their new big screen that they had installed. And Maradona realizing he's on the big screen in the stadium, obviously puts on a show, but nobody at German television were the rights holders. Nobody even noticed that this was happening. Um, while everybody else in the stadium did because I spoke to people who were there, people in the media and, and fans. And, um, and there was a Belgian uh, television producer who I later found out was actually like a, he's like a major Belgian commentator as well. Um, he came out and he, he's like, Oh my God, this stuff is really, really good. Does anybody have tape of this? So a few days later, German television sent him a 12 minute tape and he edited down into those two minutes and 28 seconds which would then just go viral, and, and you know it's been used. It's been used everywhere. Is that is that the one where he's he's in he's in the blue tracksuit and he's and he's got very 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 short shorts on? Is that the one? That's the same video I'm thinking of. Yes, yeah. There's only yeah. so many Maradona warm up videos you would have seen. Yeah, and exactly. his boots are undone and whatever. And that's the one. Yeah, he's yeah. Dancing yeah. to the music. Yeah. No, it's funny. That's the story behind it. You may learn something new every day. Thank you very much yeah. for that. Oh, that's fascinating. Actually, I bet you enjoy little little snippets, little projects like that in your work. Yeah, it's a it's a nice change from like I said, from all the day to day pandemic negativity that you know, so you, I have you know, to write about. Oh, I can imagine. I, I hate to I hate to drag you in because we, we've we've had a bit of a rule on our on our show of of, of not talking about it as, as much as possible. But you know, get, getting somebody like yourself to come on board and have a chat to us would be would be crazy not to ask because you've got you've got your finger on the pulse of, of so many of so many key influencers in the industry. How how I mean obviously we've we've seen in the news about Project Restart and Arsenal and was it West Ham have, have started and Brighton have started opening up the training training pitches and how are you seeing it from from your perspective of of, of Project Restart? I mean look, I think um, I think right now what football wants to do is be as prepared as they can be. I'm talking about the Premier League now. Um, be as prepared as they possibly can be if they get permission to restart and to and to play all the games. Um, but I think they're well aware that it's going to be extremely difficult. And I think 
I think there's a lot of clubs that would probably rather not come back, but obviously they want that TV money. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think lower down the food chain, I think it's a it's a non-starter. I mean, if you look at the if you look at the protocol that's been that's been laid out, um, in fact, in other countries, because in England, as far as I know, we don't even have we don't even have a medical protocol yet, right? Mm-hmm. We don't even have in in Germany. You know, the league got together with um, the, all the medical officers, and they said, if you want to do this safely, you have to do this and this and that, and this many people at the games. As far as I know, here in the Premier League, they haven't even gotten that far yet. Yeah. No, um, no. So, you know, they want to be seen. I think to do everything they can to finish the season, so that there's no question with the TV money. Um, I think that's what it's primarily about. But further down the food chain. This is just one gigantic expense. I mean, I, I know obviously it's not an issue for Man City, but you know, League One and League Two, and, and there's so many. I know you're you're in the Northwest, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So South Manchester, yeah. Right. So you know what a hotbed of football it is. How many smaller clubs there are around there, and it's madness, I think, to have these clubs come back and play behind closed doors when, you know, virtually all their income comes from gate receipts, and mm-hmm. they have expenses, and they have players out of contract on June thirtieth. So I think. Hopefully we can come back and play in the Premier League in those situations where the TV money is big enough that it's worthwhile and hopefully you can do it safely. But, you know, the last word belongs to the government and, and to the pandemic. Do you, do you think we, we, when it comes to sort of the medical response, because we, we, the UK is quite, what, what, two or three weeks behind the curve when it comes to mainland Europe? Do you think we're waiting to see what the likes of Germany and, and Spain and Italy do first and take, take sort of examples of their learnings? before we'd make judgments? I mean, look, I think you can always learn from from other countries' experiences. And, you know, I'd learn not just from mainland Europe, but I look at, you know, Korea, Taiwan, China. I mean, I, I'm sure they've done that and they're doing that. The one thing that I would really caution against and be, the one thing that would concern me, and again, I am not a doctor. Neither of us are experts, right? I'm just going by what I read. So Yeah, absolutely, yeah. But is this business with the testing. So Germany has been doing what, 100,000, 120,000 tests a day for the past month, right? Um, In Italy, I think it's the last three weeks, we've been around 60 to 65,000 tests on average, except on weekends. Um, You know, here, uh, it's been really, really difficult to get those those tests up. Um, I think, you know, it's been between 20 and 22,000, 25,000 on good days. And I think that might really impact things um, because, I mean, this is another thing with the testing, right? People, and, and as of, I'll bring it back, I'm going to bring it back to football. People have made a, people have made a point and, um, and I think it's a very valid point that, look, we, you know, we don't want to give tests to footballers when there's key workers and nurses and stuff like that who, who need them. And I think that's, I think that's very, very valid, not to mention sick people who need them, right? Um, but the reality of the situation we're in um, is anybody with 125 pounds can get a test privately Yeah. right now. And when it comes to footballers, you know, when Kevin De Bruyne has a knee problem, I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that he doesn't go to his local GP who then refers him to the NHS. You know, he goes through a whole set of very expensive private high-end medical doctors. Um, Normally based in Barcelona, I think it's Dr. Cruz, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Wherever. Um, So it's like footballers don't receive this normal, the same care that normal people feel. So the way I see it is, if those tests are available, you know, if we value rank and file sick people and key workers, then those tests are out there; they're available. Just have to pay for them, and we either make our government pay for them. If the government's going to say, well, no, we can't afford it or we choose not to, and somebody's still going to sell those tests, then I don't really have a problem. Because like I said, in everyday life, if you hurt your back, you're going to get presumably far worse treatment than a professional athlete will get or that Idris Elba will get. Or yeah. you, you know what I'm saying? Like that's just the reality of the world we live in. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but that is the way the system the system set up. No, absolutely. Whoever pays the most. I, I see I see that... Um... 
I think I think I read was it yesterday or the day before that the Bundesliga has bought X amount of thousand of tests for for all the all the teams and all the players, all the coaching staff, and although the, the the government's kind of mandated that all tests belong to the government, but it's all right, you know, for certain sections and certain. There's always going to be a little bit of a when it comes to the Bundesliga and football because it's such a. Uh, I don't know how it does tax wise in, in Germany, but in the UK specifically, it brings in so much finances to the UK coffers, doesn't it? It's it's, it's always going to boil down to money, which is a bit of a sad thing. What were you talking about? Were you talking about the football industry as a whole? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, although, again, um, no, it, there's no question about it. It, it. it adds prestige. I think it, it brings in money, it brings in prestige. Although, again, you look at the number of, um, you look at the number of clubs that are profitable and you look at the number of clubs and, and owners who are set up offshore and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you wonder, you know how much of the money stays here but look there's no question it has a tremendous net positive effect on the country um but i also think you have a lot of people who are going out and saying things you know i'm, I'm not going to pick on the premier league all, but i'll mention the guy in spain tebas who from day one he said well if we can't go back and play it's going to cost us a billion euros right um and he's basing that on the fact that television companies aren't going to pay up right that's kind of the same worst case calculation they've made here in the premier league Oh, well, what if Sky and BT want their money back or whatever, breach a contract? Well, you know what? That hasn't happened yet. Maybe it will happen. But the only, to my knowledge, the only place where that's actually happened is is in France, where, um, but that was also because you had, um, you know, you had broadcasters whose contract was expiring and they didn't really care about maintaining, they're like, we're not going to have football for the next three years either. But, you know, in England... Sky and BT are the Premier League's, and Amazon to a lesser degree, are the Premier League's commercial partners. And and you saw it last time, right? The domestic TV contract, the value of it went down, right? Yeah. Um, why did it go down? Because Sky and BT said, well, we paid you a ton before. Now we got to pay you a little bit less. And the Premier League says, well, I'll go to somebody else. And it's like, okay, good luck. You know, and they went to Amazon. And they did a tiny deal. Remember, they were all pretending like, oh, well, no, Google and Apple TV and all yeah. these other, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. hey, those guys ain't there. You know, they're, they're walking through that door. You know, like, uh, for better or worse, football, the Premier League, is part of the entertainment industry. And it needs commercial partners to do it. Could they go it alone one day, make their own TV? Maybe. But the fact that they haven't tells you that, so far at least, it's in their interest to, to work with Sky and BT. Yeah, I think they're, just, they're such a such a big entity, aren't they? When it comes to it, the fact the finances behind it, and as as a city as a city fan for a very long time, I'm not going to be I'm not going to stand up and say you know finances is bad in, in money in, in in the industry because it's it's brought me a lot of a lot of happiness in the last ten years. I say thirty years, but the last ten years particularly. But yeah, it's 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 funny, isn't it, how the uh, how it all goes around? But um, you know, with, with the UK being so behind the curve, you know, I was listening to uh, the head of the FIGC, the Italian Federation, said that they're, they're aiming for the 18th of May to start come back as training as full. Do you, do you think that'll be more like the, the two two players come in at a certain amount of times during the day? Do you think that? Do you think that'll be? Are they talking about full on everyone, get everyone back in training? Well, that's kind of to be determined. So they they're really angry in Italy, uh, the football folk, because as of May 4th, they eased the lockdown. And they said professional athletes and athletes of what they can, you know, what they call world renown, which is sort of their catch all to include Olympic athletes and people like that or normally amateurs. Yeah. yeah. Well, th- they can start training again. Um, except those who are involved in team sports. So, right. so that seems like a complete contradiction. I mean, I suppose the argument is that there's a different kind of social distancing if you're a swimmer and you're by yourself in the pool. Um, so technically, they can't come back and train individually even. Um, so so that's up in the air. They have a lot of other things lined up. They're raring to go. They want to go. But, you know, obviously, we were hit very hard in Italy by the, um, by the pandemic um, in terms of deaths. We've had I think 26,000 deaths and you know people don't really want to take any chances with it so I generally don't know um what's going to happen May 18th I think I also think in Italy there's less of an appetite to or there's more of a willingness I think to say look let's get this wrapped up by a certain date 
you know, if we restart training on whatever day that is, maybe we don't have to play out the rem all the remaining fixtures. You know, maybe I think they're more open. I mean, so far they haven't said this, but I think it's going to come to this. If they look at this and they say, realistically, we, we, we have three weeks in which we can play football behind closed doors. And they might, otherwise we, we stretch over into August and God knows what. Let's just go and let's just go and settle the big issues, right? Yeah. Let's go and, and settle who qualifies for the Champions League. Let's have some kind of playoff system. Let's have a relegation playoff. Let's do something like that just so we can, you know, tick that sporting merit box uh, without as much controversy and, and move on. And personally, I don't think that would be, um, that would be a bad solution. Well, it's, it's funny this because people I speak to on a daily basis. And what's your personal opinion on on the game being behind closed doors? As opposed to what? Not having um, them at all. I think, I think wait until everyone's okay enough to be able to uh, have half full stadiums or a certain number of people in the stadium. Well, first of all, I don't I don't think that half full stadiums or a certain number of people in the stadiums. I don't think that's ever going to happen. Like I, I think they're either they're either closed doors or everybody's home. Yeah. Um. You know, if you look at where they started up again, um, you know, even in places that are far ahead of us, like Taiwan or whatever, you know, they basically said no, it's closed doors. You know, in Taiwan, they have like I don't know if you saw this, they have like robot fans and they have like uh, uh, sort of mannequins who move and stuff. So no, it doesn't, it doesn't like, really yeah, check it out on YouTube. I think it's in the baseball in Taiwan that they've done it. Uh, or maybe it's Korea. I don't know. I, like I watched it. I was like, whoa, you know, this doesn't look rubbish. Um, <laughs> no, I don't. I, I, I really don't see the point. Also, because, I mean, like, you've been a Man City fan for, for 30 years, right? You said? 30, I'm 37. So since I was, before I was born. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you remember the days that you know i know man city were always a big club but there were times when you know you, you were relegated or whatever yeah, once you yeah. were already you know when main road was what maybe maybe it was two-thirds full yeah. or half full do you uh, know what? it's funny you say that we've always had good attendances we you know even when we went down to the second tier of english football we always had sort of 34 35 000 fans so we never, okay but, but you know the difference between thirty-five thousand and sixty thousand in a stadium of course, I'm driving yeah, at, right yeah. And you know it's just not the same thing. Like it really isn't. The way you get noise. I mean, I wasn't. The way you get, I mean, Man City are not a good example because you always had like your your sort of bottom of crowds was always good. But you know that there's a pack stadium, or the next best thing is a pack section in the stadium behind yeah. the goal or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Having a bunch of people sitting, you know, six feet apart, isn't going to do that. It's going to look like it's going to look stupid. It's going to look like rubbish, right? And then you still have the risk of getting these people in and out and cleaning the stadium. It's yeah. just not worth it, in my opinion. You know, you yeah. either shut it down or you reopen it up. Yeah. And that's just my, I mean, as I see it, I don't think, I don't see any benefit to doing that. No, so I think, I think where we are in the year now and towards the, as, we, as, the, as the weeks go by, I just keep thinking more and more that's going to be behind closed doors rather than because we can't afford to wait for the 30,000, 15,000, 20,000 people in a stadium. We just, it's just it's just not going to be healthy enough for people to do that. Is It's not going to be safe enough for people to do no. that. We've been months away from doing that. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, I mean, most countries that have loosened the lockdown, they've said, oh, but, you know, like no more than 50 people. Even this other stuff, I mean, like, I, I, I'm just going by what I read in the news, right? People have said, oh, we'll get <laughs> antibody passports. We don't even know if if once you've had it, if you, if you have the antibodies, you're immune, right? We're not at that stage. I mean, what's been suggested is maybe if at some point we discover that if you have the if you've had the antibody, um, so in other words, if you've had the disease, you're immune. Maybe we can get antibody passports and allow people who ha who've had it, yeah. who've done, you know, let those guys back. Um, but again, we're we're months away from this, you know. Um, maybe maybe they'll find a cure, like some sort of treatment that very efficiently treats people. Maybe then, or otherwise, we got to sit around and wait for the vaccine. Oh, yeah. it's, it, either way, I don't think um, either of us earn enough money to decide what's going to happen. Exactly. <laughs> and even if we did have a lot of money, you know what? We certainly wouldn't have the medical or epidemiological epidemiological knowledge. So let's leave it to the experts. That's a good word for the day. That's my uh, my words. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on from this now. I've just got two more points just to just to ask you before before we shoot off. And um, what ones with with the Italian connection and uh, the constant link of, of Pep and, and Juventus. 
Um, this this is a bi-weekly thing now. We're, we keep hearing it, it, it. If City lose a game, we're going to run a bad run before you know it. Is the Juventus manager next season? It, is there any truth in this? Do they do they want him as a club? Is it from your what's your opinion on that? Man, this is one of the most bizarre stories, and I don't oh, just want to bring it back to the pandemic, but. You know all those rumors and stuff, that all those YouTube conspiracies and stuff like that? that when this story, when this Pep to Juve story broke last summer, um, it wasn't driven by the Italian mainstream media because they went and they checked. And like, it's, not, it's not like Pep talks every day, but it's not impossible either, right? You, you know, his, brother, his brother, Pere, is an agent. The dude answers the phone. And they went and they checked with him. Juve don't often comment, but, you know, Juve still, once they appointed Sarri, they kind of made it clear that they have Sarri. It's not Pep. And yet, it was, it's a guy named, um, I was one specific guy, I'm not going to name check him, but who's who reports on transfers and he goes on a local TV station and stuff like that. He kept hammering this. Um... And then it's a lot of YouTubers and bloggers and people on Twitter. Very, so no mainstream journalist who covers you regularly was pushing this story. I mean, and look, believe me, everybody, I mean, look, I mean, Pep to Juve would have been enormous, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody, everybody reached out to Pep's people and to Juve and to City. And then they tried to look at it. You know, was there some sort of mystery clause where he could leave and blah, blah, blah? Everybody pushed every angle and nobody found anything and the situation got really really bad it got really bad because you had armies of Juve fans um, on Twitter on forums you had these YouTubers who were really viciously attacking um, and I say this as a member of the mainstream media really viciously attacking the mainstream media saying oh you and your lies no Pep's coming you guys were wrong about this you were wrong about Ronaldo the same way they got Ronaldo they can get Pep some people were suggesting that you know Juve's share price was being somehow manipulated although Again, you know, the share price did move a bit, but again, you got to kind of have to prove to me how that actually benefits Juve. It might have benefited individual speculators who were buying and selling the stocks. I don't know. But again, the volume isn't that big. Um, you'll remember that there's an Italian guy who sits on the board of Manchester City, a guy named, uh, his last name is Galassi's first name. I don't know what it is. He, um, he's, uh, I, I think he's involved with uh, Piaggio who makes scooters. But anyway, he's on the board of Manchester City. He did something which I thought I'd never see. A Manchester City board member, and I think apart, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, apart from Khaldun's sort of annual address, nobody on Manchester City's board ever speaks always to the quiet. Yeah, it's always okay. quiet. We quite like that, to be honest. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. Look, I mean, board members at serious companies shouldn't speak out, and they don't, right? Um, this guy went on live television in Italy, and he said, look, I never thought I'd speak, but I have to speak. This is all nonsense. And still they pushed it. And there were conspiracy theories. And there was somehow that, you know, because Agnelli is on the UEFA Exco, he was going to get city banned and that would activate a clause so that Pep would run away and immediately join Juve. I mean, look, there's no question that Juventus would love to have Pep Guardiola. There's no question of that whatsoever in my mind. I think every club in the world would want him. Um... But there's zero, and, and it's entirely possible that they did approach him in the past, maybe even in the recent past. But they certainly weren't on the verge of getting him last May. Um, and there's certainly not, as far as I know, as far as anybody can tell, you know, going to go and get him now in the midst of a pandemic. Mm. And there's one more obvious reason, one more, just on a very basic football level. If you've got Cristiano Ronaldo and you're paying him you know, close to a million pounds a week. And he's a very specific player with a very specific skill set. And he's, what, 34, 35 years old. Does he look like the kind of player that Pep would work with? Does he look like the kind of striker or, or wing or whatever position he wants to play this week? Somebody who would fit into a Pep Guardiola team? No, he doesn't, right? Do you think Pep could even envision a team where he says, hey, you, you don't really run much and you don't dribble much and you never defend and you never press. But tell you what, you go stand up front and just slightly off on the wing and the rest of us will all work hard for you. That's a really good point. Yeah. I mean, point. you know, 
I mean, this is the guy who dropped Aguero against Barcelona, right? Because supposedly didn't work hard yeah. enough. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Can't imagine Cristiano will be too happy about that in uh, El Clasico, can he, being dropped? But yeah, yeah or uh, whatever it might be, so yeah. There'll be a day when Pep leaves Manchester City, and maybe he will go to, to Juventus. But I don't, I certainly don't think it's now. And I no. don't think he ever came close to leaving. Yeah, as a... As a um... As, as, as a City fan by heart, I, 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 I love Pep Guardiola. I love everything about him. I love, I love what he's brought to the club. And it was all started off by sort of uh, what, Mancini, then Pellegrini. And we, 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 to be, we seem to be building up and up and up. So, yeah, long may he reign. But we, I think we're all realistic enough to know that he will go at some point. And, and talking about that, have you, have you heard, all, heard the rumours about potentially um, um, Alonso being Pep's number two? Because obviously we're, we're, we're number two list at the moment, aren't we, with uh, Arteta going to Arsenal? Of Chabi Alonso joining as, as number two. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've heard the rumors. All I know about Chabi Alonso um, is that he's he's in that studying phase, you know, the intelligent players want to go through. He doesn't know what he wants to do, you know, when he, quote, unquote, grows up. Um, and he knows that, you know, I mean, like, when I spoke to him, and this is a while back, he knew he was, he was holding all the cards. Um, you know, just retired, played in different countries, knows everything that's up, played under, you know, tremendous managers, won everything. Um, you know, he can write his own, he can, he, you know, he, he, can, he can write his own destiny. He must so, have been fantastic to talk to. His, his yeah, own brain must have been phenomenal to just pick apart for 10 minutes. <laughs> he's a super bright guy. And he's also, you know, what impressed me about him was, I mean, I spoke to him informally, but he's a guy who asks a ton of questions. You know, a, a lot of these people, you know, they're used to answering questions. They never ask questions, you mm -hmm. know. Um, it's a weird one. I mean, I, I, I think back to the first time I had a one-on-one -on -one with Pep and, I've written about this tons of times. I don't know if you ever came across it. Um, but occasionally I love to go back and look at my notes from that interview or, or the piece I wrote because I thought about how wrong Pep was about everything. Um, if I have a quick story, if I can share the story, I, I, I went to see Pep um, when he was in Qatar. Um, and I remember I'd go, I'd go up and he's training and you know he looks grumpy. I didn't have an appointment or anything. But, you know, it's Qatar. There's nobody there. There's no, nothing to do. And so I say, hey, can we chat? And we ended up talking for, we made an appointment to meet the next day. And we ended up talking for like an hour. And Pep talked about how football had changed, how there would be no space for somebody like him in football after he retired, that if he had come through as a young player, he would probably be a third division player, that football was all about athleticism, uh, that football wasn't about space. It wasn't about keeping the ball. I mean, this was around 2005. Um, and how he didn't know what he was going to do and quit, but he probably wouldn't be in football and how his vision of football was dead. Um, I think to myself, like, man, you got that one. I don't know if I caught him on a bad day or if he was just being super <laughs> negative, but man, you got that all wrong, you know? I, that's one way to look at it or I like to look at it like yeah that's what football was like at that stage of you know in your final days of your career but you came back and you changed it you know you turned it into possession and, and pressing and, and and passing um and that's what I find so fascinating about the guy that's you amazing know. that's an amazing story yeah no, I mean I, I wonder what clicked what what kind of was it was it Johan Cruyff had a word with him and said, "Listen, no, you 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 stick to your philosophy and you carry on playing it." It's it's funny that isn't it? I'd love to know what happened after that conversation between then and it's, it's, the football the way we see it, well, the way I see it anyway. I don't know. I mean, I think he went back to Barcelona, realized he missed football, started working with kids, and said, "Screw it, you know, if I'm going to be here, I'll try to do things a certain way." Because you know, even this Barcelona thing that people talk about, La Masia, blah blah blah. You know, the football that Barcelona played under Frank Rijkaard um, or even under Van Hal before that, that wasn't the football that they played under Pep. You know, that wasn't the stereotypical um, tiki-taka football, mm. which, by the way, Pep himself has evolved, right? If you watch Barcelona 2010 compared to Bayern 2015, 
I'd say even compare it, you know, if you compare his second season at City, uh, I guess when you won the title um, for the first time under Pep, um, you compare that with this season. I mean, I think there's very obvious differences. Um, you know, certain very broad philosophy, but but that's what makes the guy interesting, right? He's always evolving. He's mm. always trying to, and, and sometimes it blows up in his face, like when he like when he drops Aguero. Um, but you know, he's always looking to get that extra edge, um, and and I think that's what makes him such a such an interesting guy. Fantastic. Listen, you, uh, you, you've 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 made my week, Gabriel. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it, and it's good to. Uh... It's good to put myself in, in and try and listen to your shoes as, as, a, as a journalist doing what you do and working as hard as ever to get out the stories. No worries. It's my pleasure. You know what? Um, I think this is one of the very few times that I've interacted with City fans that haven't been asked about financial fair play. So I'm grateful for that as well. Oh, yeah. We'll, 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 <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we don't need to talk about that. Everyone talks about that, don't they? <laughs> exactly. Take care and, uh, and, and stay safe. Fantastic. Good man. See you soon. All right, man. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye.